Ah, that's so good. To God be the glory. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has what? Raised us. Raised us from what? Raised us from death to life, right? We're promised the future of heaven for all that have trusted Christ. And we're going to sing about that now. Stand together as we sing, Mighty to Save. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. to save, He is mighty to save, forever author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I The hymn says, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, what? It is well with my soul. And I trust you can say that and sing this from your heart tonight. 
when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say. Sing all the parts. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. My sin. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Pick it up even another notch, sing it even louder. And Lord, haste the day my face shall be signed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall singing so much. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that your word is very clear that Jesus does not just bring peace or talk about peace, teach about peace. Jesus is our peace. So, Lord, even tonight as we have already worshipped you by singing and now we will worship you by opening our hearts to your word, I pray that we would not be just hearers but doers of what we hear. And then as there's a chance to share after that, the Lord, you would truly be exalted, lifted up high. Because if Jesus is lifted up, the promise is that you will draw people to yourself. So, Father, may this be an evening we want to enjoy it, but as our most honored guest, Lord, may may you love tonight way more than even we do, Lord. Our desire is to praise you, to at least in some feeble way express our gratitude for what it is that you have done and are doing for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Do you have a good day? 
Whew. We had kind of a lazy day, but it got off to the best start of any day this week. I got to go down and have breakfast and some time in the Word with the colony guys. And um, I, I, I have high standards. I said, I love you guys, but I'm not coming if there's no bacon. <laughs> but the colony bacon is something pretty special. And hey, they had bacon. And um, we, had, we had a rich time in the Word, didn't we, guys? That was a, that was a sweet time, great way to start the day. Anybody not have the handouts that we're using this week? If you want to raise your hand, we'll, we'll get one to you. There's a few. Oceana, dry your hands off before you handle those, will you please? They don't want soaking wet handouts. They'll get all mushy. A couple there, a guy up here. Got one up front in this side too, Oceana. One over here. See how fast we can make her run around the room. Yes. Some of you have your handouts, but you're raising your hands anyway, because you just you just want to look at those arms up close and see what the deal is there. We make a big pivot in our series called Treasured, celebrating God's love for his daughters. Um, remember, this is a six-parter. We're only doing four parts here. So we're actually skipping number three. We will, we will also skip number five. So we'll do four tonight, six tomorrow night. But just, just a word about number three uh, that, that we're skipping. The first session, who did we study? Who was the woman whose life we looked at? Hagar. And, and what's, what's the bottom line teaching? God sees and values his daughters. Others saw her as invisible. She's an Egyptian slave, person of little value. She had, she had made some mistakes. She's not even from within the covenant family of, of Israel. But God chased her down, God found her, and she even gives God a name, this is the God who sees me. And that's, that's just a beautiful thought. Last night, who's the character we looked at last night? Deborah. Deborah, strong lady, strong lady. God is not threatened by strong women, he loves strong women. He has big plans. And just like he did with Deborah, God elevates and empowers his daughters. We're skipping session three, but just a, a word about it. It's on the life of Hannah, and it's, um, it's beautiful. As soon as we film this and get it out there, check it out on our website. You can either buy the DVD series, or you can also stream it through our app. Um, this is, that third one is an important one. It, it's killing me to skip it but I want to do two from the Old Testament and then finish with two from the New Testament. That, that launches us in, God hears and understands his daughters. I mean, even the priest. Th this shows how even leaders can mess things up for God's daughters. She's crying out in her heart before the Lord, and the priest thinks she's drunk. He tries to send her away. To shut her up, God hears and he understands Hannah and he answers the, the yearning of her heart. We, we now pivot to the New Testament. And let me just say a word about this. Now we're going to be talking about, about Jesus for the most part in this session. There's a, there's a wonderful verse, you, you know this verse. I know it in too many versions, which is why I have trouble quoting it now. The Word became flesh, John 1:14, and dwelled among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I mean, we're talking in this series about how God thinks about 
his daughters, how God relates to his daughters, how he interacts with them. And when we get to the New Testament, it's not God who is spirit, it's not God who's way up there, it's, it's God who put on skin, came to earth through the incarnation, born as a little dependent baby boy, he grows up, and when he starts his public ministry, the main thing he's trying to do is show us the Father. Even Jesus didn't make it all about himself. He was here to show us the love of God. And so when we come to these, these last three talks, which are from the New Testament, this, this is when it's like people face to face. It's, it's not somebody talking to God through prayer. It's somebody having a conversation with him in real time, in real space. And so it's going to get even, even more exciting if that's even possible. This session that we're going to talk about today is about the Samaritan woman. We know her as Woman Well. That's her first name and last name, Woman Well, middle name Atha. We don't know her name, which also says something about the place that women had in the culture. A lot of them were just kind of nameless. But they're not in nameless, invisible, insignificant to God. And there's so many surprises in this passage. One of the guys who was here, who's a pastor, came up to me beforehand tonight, and he said, I just want to tell you something. He says, if you let this series only be taught to women, that's a sin. Because guys need this. Guys are creating a lot of the problem where women get a distorted view of God because how we as men treat our daughters, our wives, our mothers, the women we work with. And I pull out my phone and I said, will you like say that into my video camera? Because I'm going to need that ammunition when I go home and talk to some of our staff who don't yet get what this course is all about. And he willy one taked it, I mean perfect from beginning to end, no edits necessary. Um, I'm, I'm so excited about this. I'm more excited about the second half of this series than even the first half, so we better get going because I have miles to go before you sleep. We pick up the story in John chapter 4, 1 through 6, and I'm not, you're not going to hear a lot of stories, a lot of illustrations from me tonight because the power of this narrative is just so obvious. It just jumps off the page. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Jesus is rejected in his own hometown of Nazareth. The, the heat is on. He's growing popularity with the crowds, he's, he's teaching, he's performing miracles, but the religious leaders are upset because he's threatening the status quo. He's putting their power, their control at risk, and so Jesus is really in the process of moving his ministry headquarters up to the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee to a city called Capernaum. Now, he had to go through Samaria. Well, now he didn't have to go through Samaria. And, and may, I, may I just show you this for a minute? If, if this is our map of, of the Holy Land, all right, and, and this is the Sea of Galilee right here, and then over on the east side of the land there's the Jordan River, and that dumps into the Dead Sea. Considering that, y'all are looking pretty good, considering you're in the Dead Sea. Um, over there would be the Mediterranean, and this section right here, you've made it to the promised land. You are in Israel. And, and here is Jesus. He's down in Judea, which is the province around, it, it, it's the province that's around um, Jerusalem, that, that kind of area. It's kind of right on the northern edge of the Dead Sea. And Jesus is going to head back up to where? Up to Galilee. Now, the shortest route is to go just straight north. 
But that would take him through a province called Samaria. Then he would get up to the province of Galilee, up around the Sea of Galilee. Good Jewish boys would not let Samaritan sand hit their sandals. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They called them half-breeds. When Assyria scattered Israel and, and sent them away toward the end of the Old Testament, they repopulated the land of Israel with other conquered people from elsewhere. Those, that's how the Samaritans got there. And so they kind of were Jewish, but they weren't really Jewish. They might have even gone along with some of the customs, but it, for the most part, it hadn't changed their heart. And so the prejudice ran deep. There were some really good Samaritans, by the way. You saw one Monday night, remember, the parable of the good Samaritan? Wow, that would have shaken up their categories. A good Samaritan? Are you kidding me? So the expectation would be that Jesus would take his disciples. He's not going to swim across the Dead Sea, so he'd come here, and he'd cross over the Jordan River. He'd walk up this area, even though it's desert, Maybe he'd cut back through south of the Sea of Galilee. Maybe he'd even go up around the Sea of Galilee and then into the province of Galilee. Jesus doesn't do that. This is like their first ministry trip. This is their first short-term mission. This is a field trip, and he takes them right through the heart of Samaria. Sir, would you stand up, please, in the blue shirt there? You look like a motorcycle man. You got Harley Davidson. It's a miracle. There he is. This is, this is Ward. Everybody say, hi, Ward. Hi, Ward. Ward, and, and who's that seated next to you? My wife, Becky. Yeah, Becky, will you stand up, please? A lot of you may not know this before, but she wasn't so into the motorcycle thing when they started dating, and she's like, you know, the, the, I, just, I, just don't, I just don't know that I can trust this deal. And Ward goes, stay here. And he goes back and he hooks on a sidecar. And she's been riding in the sidecar ever since. It's not backseat siding, it's sidecar driving. You just think of them and think of the city of Sychar, or sidecar. There you go, have a seat. Perfect. Never have I had somebody with a Harley Davidson shirt on who was seated in the right place. That just is, that's epic. So Jesus takes his disciples right through Samaria to the city of Sychar. And that's where this story takes place, near the plot of ground that David had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Now, a lot of people make a big deal that you don't draw water in the middle of the day, it's hot, that's morning work. This proves that the woman was an outcast in the town, she was rejected by the other woman. It's possible that that's true. That's a lot to stack up on a simple statement, it was noon. So I kind of take that maybe with a shaker of salt. but. Um, Jesus is sitting there, and he says to her in verse 7, Will you give me a drink? Parenthesis, his disciples had gone to the town to buy food, so they're not around. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? In case we don't get the culture, here's the explanation in the parenthesis, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. This is a man talking to a woman in public. Everybody go, <gasps> yeah. This is worse than that. This is a Jew talking to a Samaritan. So now we've got two of them. <gasps> yeah, even worse. This is a rabbi, a holy man, a speaker for God, teaching to a woman, and, and again, the conventional interpretation is that she's immoral. Um, it's, there's some things in the story that I'm beginning to wonder if that's actually true or not. But anyway, whatever, we're going to see she's been looking for love in all the wrong places. She's had a very 
difficult, looking for love in all the wrong places. That's 348 in the Baptist hymnal, if you're not <laughs> familiar with that particular song. But, but she's, she's, had, she's had a tough life. Not the kind of person that you would think a holy leader might engage in conversation. So now we've got three. Ready? Take a breath and go. <gasps> yeah, this is, this is complicated. The woman, whoops, stuttered. The woman is surprised by Jesus' request because it clashes with religious and cultural customs. One of the things, if you want to get my blood boiling, I, I, I mean, all the discussions that are going on, all the, all the conflict that there is in our country, all the, all the wars that are going on in churches, so much of it is people trying to present a distorted picture of Jesus. One of the reasons our culture is rejecting Jesus is because we're not presenting him as he truly is. Oh, Jesus, wow, you know, you talk about he's done more to hold back women than any person in history. That is absolute rubbish. Jesus, Jesus consistently in his ministry, he elevated women. Jesus consistently in his ministry, he placed high value upon God's daughters. And yet there's this distorted view. This is one of those stories where we just get the truth even if it meant going against the customs of the day and breaking some of the rules that weren't even biblical laws at all. They were just the invention of people, even sometimes religious leaders. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you what? Living water. Well, now I'm curious. The woman must have thought, living water. I don't think she goes, oh yeah, like in biology, the protozoa swimming around in there. No, that's not the kind of living water. What does it mean, living water? Water is an inanimate object. What is this, what is this living water? Jesus continues the conversation and he stirs the woman's curiosity. We're not looking at it under this filter tonight, but if you want to know how to share your faith effectively with somebody else, you, you got the ultimate model for it right here. He just leads her. He gets her thinking. She wants to know more. He doesn't dump the whole truck of truth. He just kind of, he just kind of gives her a little bit, gets her brain engaged in the process. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his son and his livestock? I mean, Jesus is perfectly justified. He goes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm not just a messenger of God. I am God in human form. But he doesn't say that. His main goal is not to educate her, it's to, it's to win her heart. Now fully engaged, the woman asks questions that take the conversation deeper. How many of you sometimes teach, whether it's the Bible or something else? You teach, look around. I knew, I knew it. I can tell that by the conversations we're having between sessions. I'm like, there are more teachers per cubic foot here than any place else in the state. Of, nobody in, in New Jersey is learning anything this week because you're all gathered here. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Isn't it fun when you're teaching, even if it's just a conversation with one of your kids, and you say something, and one of your students or your daughter or your son goes, well, wait a minute, Mom, wait a minute, Dad, wait a minute, teacher. If that's true, then what about this? And you glance down at your notes and you're like, sweet. That's the next topic. That's so fun when you're just kind of flowing with the Spirit and it's like the Spirit is leading this lesson, the Spirit is leading this conversation. That seems to happen a lot in the ministry of Jesus. A whole lot. 
Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to what? How in the world, how in the world did we move from, ma'am, please give me a drink, I'm thirsty, to now, he's throwing the idea of living water out there, I don't really know what that is, but I'm interested, I'd like that. You mean I don't have to come to the well every day and draw? That would be sweet. And now, the new topic is eternal life. You have friends who have the gift of evangelism, or some of you in the room have the gift of evangelism. I don't have the gift of evangelism. I'm told, like we all are, to do the work of an evangelist, all right? To always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lives within us. But I, I'm, I'm telling you, some of my friends who have the gift of evangelism, they are ridiculous. I, I, I mean, they can take any topic any subject, and somehow, to what to me would be so cheesy and awkward, when they do it, all of a sudden they and the other person are talking about eternal life. Man, I try to learn from them, but I, I, just, I just marvel at that. That's how Jesus is. We've moved from give me a drink to living water to now we're talking about eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus transitions the conversation from physical thirst to eternal life, and he does it beautifully. He does it absolutely seamlessly. Now, verse 16. Sort of gets interesting. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Notice her response. Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. I'm not sure I'm glad that you're a prophet. I'm not sure you know all these things about me but but this is not you're not from around here how do you know anything about me but yet you seem to know me very very well Jesus transitions the conversation but 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 now now all of a sudden it's getting real personal what do you think would have happened had Jesus started the conversation here Hey, uh, ma'am, I'm, hi, I'm Jesus. Um, we, we need to talk about your life. You've been married, what is it now, five times? And currently the guy you're with, he's not your husband? That would have been a very short conversation. I don't know how much water she intended on drawing from the well, how many bucketfuls she was going to pull up from the ground, but it's like, it's enough. We can just sip tonight at dinner. I don't need to do laundry tonight. The sheep, they don't need to drink anything. I'm out of here. That would have been a very short conversation. If we're going to engage the culture around us, it doesn't work to lead with the culture wars. It's hard to love a culture that we are at war with. And, the, and there, there, are, there are big differences. I, un, I understand this. And as things get more and more polarized, I'm not minimizing that at all. What's interesting, the example of Jesus is he doesn't start, he doesn't start with the controversial part. Now, again, the conventional interpretation of this is that, you know, those, that's one divorce after another. What is it? She must be really, really, really hard to live with. Well, that's, that's potentially the answer. Some would say, well, this is proof right here that, that she's probably immoral, she's probably cheated on a bunch of guys, and I'm like, wow, that's a pretty big leap in this passage. It's possible, it's possible 
she's had a bunch of husbands die, and not necessarily from her cooking. I mean, it could have been random circumstances, right? We don't really know what it is has caused this woman, but, but at a minimum, we would go, she's had a really hard life. How much of it is her own making? How much of it is circumstances? Maybe she just has like incredibly poor taste in men. I, we don't know. I think we've got to be careful about making Scripture say things that it doesn't even necessarily say. But Jesus doesn't lead with that. He's already got her by the heart. They're talking about eternal life. And now it gets personal. When Jesus addresses, when Jesus addresses her personal life, the woman shifts the conversation to a theological and cultural issue. Are you telling me that is not exactly what people do today? When it starts to get to issue of the heart, when it's starting to make sense, it's like, oh wow, I, I'm a sinner too. Well, yeah, but let me ask you about this. What about the people in Africa who never hear? Are they seriously going to... Is God going to send them to hell? Would that be fair? What, what, about, what about children who aren't even old enough? Let's, you got to explain this to me. And, and I've, I've had it happen to me 50 times where the conversation that looked like it was, it was really moving toward the person considering eternity and Jesus' love for them, now they want to talk theology. Look, look what she comes up with. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. How does Jesus answer that? He basically says, who cares? Now he's smoother than that. He's, he's nicer than that, but he says, woman, Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship who we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and that time has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. He's like, no, we're not going to get detoured by that. That's a distraction. That's not relevant. And, and subtly, but pretty directly, pretty firmly, Jesus refocuses their conversation on what is most essential. Now the woman goes, okay, okay, okay. I've, I've heard, I know people who are Jewish, I've heard them talk about this Messiah, this deliverer that the Jews are looking for. Look what she says. I know that Messiah, called the Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. This is the next thing that people do. I get it now. And you know what? Someday, someday, I'm going to act on this. There was a guy in our first church. I shouldn't say in our first church because he was definitely not in our church. His wife came faithfully to our church, and, and her husband, like, rarely came. He was, maybe he was like a CEO Christian. You know Christians who are CEOs? CEO stands for Christmas and Easter only. Um, and and he, he would come, and he had some real health problems, and there were several times when I would get the call that, that this gentleman probably is not going to make it. And his wife would say, Pastor, will you go visit him? Will you, will you explain the gospel? He's heard it, but he's never put his trust in Jesus Christ. I'll never forget this one time. His name was Dutch. That's what everybody called him. And, and I, went, I went to meet with Dutch, and, um, you know, we kind of went through that Jesus has died in his place. And, I mean, he's hooked up to all sorts of things, but he's able to talk, and, and I'm just really feeling this may be the last conversation we ever had. And, and so I said, look, I said, it's not, it's not enough 
that you can recite back to me the facts of who Jesus was and even what he did. It's, it's, like, it's like a gift. It's not yours until you take it and by faith receive it. And I had in my pocket a shiny new pen. It was gold. It was a cross pen. Somebody had given it to me for graduation. It's like, it's like a fancy schmancy pen. I lose pens. I don't buy nice pens now because it's too frustrating. But I had this nice shiny pen, and I thought, okay. So I take it out of my pocket, and I, I said, Dutch, what if I said to you this is a gift? I'll tell you, it's gold, it's a cross pen, it's got, it's got my name on it, but I'm offering it to you. What is it that you have to do? Pretty good illustration, right? It's not yours till you receive it. And he goes, thank you very much, Pastor. And he reaches up and he takes the pen. He goes, because when I get out of here, I'm going to have a lot of thank you notes to write because I know people have really been praying for me. I'm like, What? I, I drove home 45 miles back to the town where li we lived. I'm beating up on myself. I'm like, I'm like, I'm a total failure, and Dutch is going to be lost for all of eternity, and I lost my nice pen because <laughs> he missed the whole point of the whole conversation. I'll tell you something really cool. God spared his life more times. And we lived there, what, like six years about, something like that. We moved away. After we moved away, we got word that Dutch had asked Jesus as his Savior. Yeah. He never repented and gave me my pen back. But, you know, sanctification is a slow process. Jesus refocuses the conversation on what is essential, and she says, I know Messiah is coming. When he comes, then I'll do something about that. Pastor, thanks. You've explained the gospel well, and you know what? If I'm ever, like, really, really sick and might not make it, I'm like, hello, we're there, Dutch. Then I'll, then I'll act on that. He and his wife invited us over to their house. He'd never invited a pastor to his house before. The whole church leadership team is praying. He goes, you know how to play spoons? Spoons is a cutthroat game. In fact, he goes, hey, let's up the ante. Let's play forks. So we're playing forks, and, and I, somewhere in the course of this game, I, like, jab a fork into my hand, and again, my friends with the gift of evangelism can pull this off. I'm like, you know, when I look at that wound on my hand, I can't help but think of Jesus on the cross. And Dutch goes, park it, pastor. We're here to play cards, not talk Bible. It's your deal. Eventually, though, the hounds of heaven tracked him down. And I'm going to see him again in heaven someday. Hope he brings my pen. <laughs> Jesus chooses, this is shocking, Jesus chooses this Samaritan woman as one of the first people to whom he reveals his true identity. Because in that verse that we just looked at, when she says, when he comes, he'll explain to us everything. Jesus simply says, I, the one speaking to you, I'm he. I'm the Messiah. I'm the deliverer. You know, Monday night when we saw all those parables, the parables in our walk through the New Testament, Jim hasn't learned that yet. You've got to tell Jim to get back down to Atlanta for more training so you can do NT Live. You can't tell half the story. You can't stop with the Old Testament. But this is a sign for parable start. And I always thought that was the dumbest hand sign in the world. So somebody explained it to me. The parables do, th do things. We know that for some people, they open up truth. He'll take complicated theological, theoretical stuff and he'll use a mustard seed. You know, he'll, he'll use different types of soil to illustrate that. And man, that opened my eyes. The parables also conceal truth. For some, they reveal it. For some, they conceal it. Because if they're not open to it, God is mercifully keeping them from being responsible 
for that extra truth that they're not ready to act on anyway. So a lot of times in his ministry, Jesus didn't go, Hi, I'm Jesus. I'm the promised Messiah. You've been waiting for me for, for generations. I'm finally here. Let's go. He doesn't reveal his identity that freely. He chooses a Samaritan woman who's been married five times. Think Jesus places a high value on women? Why, why this woman? You think she's somebody who would have like massive credibility with the people who know her after all the struggles of her life? But Jesus saw something in her heart that nobody else had ever seen. This is Jesus in action. He chooses this Samaritan woman as one of the first people to whom he reveals his true identity. Just then, his disciples return and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? But, but I can imagine, I can imagine they're like talking amongst themselves. They're probably going, is this like, does, does he not know who she is, you know? And, and this is probably pretty controversial. The disciples view this encounter as at least surprising, maybe even inappropriate. Maybe even inappropriate. It's not the last time that Jesus will break the rules of the culture because his kingdom operates based on the law of love, not a bunch of human-made rules. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? It's interesting she phrases that as a question. I, I want to someday ask her, didn't you know at that point that he was the Messiah? And I think she might go, sure I did. But he led me by asking questions, not by dumping a bunch of answers on me. So I thought that worked pretty good with me. I thought I'd try it with the people in the city. I wouldn't be surprised if she says that. It's not in the Bible. It's pure speculation on part. I have a sanctified imagination. But it's pretty cool. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Based on the woman's account, others from Sychar go to meet the potential Messiah. Wow. Isn't it interesting in our churches? Hey, we're going to do, do a new training on um, how to share your faith with people. It's a 32-week series. There's about 115 Bible verses you'll need to memorize. We're going to role play this till Jesus returns, and then someday we may actually talk to a lost person. <laughs> Jesus doesn't waste any time deploying her. And there's actually a phenomenon that, that occurs. The, the longer you are a believer, the easier it is to just surround yourself all with other believers. Now, don't misunderstand me. If you're finishing up at Barbara's place, if you're, if you're in the colony and you go to your covenant church or, or, or you go home, you better choose friends who are committed followers of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you will get sucked right back in to whatever messed up your life in the first place. Having said that, however, you know who some of the best evangelists are? They're always the new believers. They're the new believers. They still have the meaningful relationships with people, and, and it's so fresh and exciting to them, they are not worried about being rejected because they've just been accepted by the God of heaven. What do I care what other people? It, it's like Lazarus after he was raised from the dead. It's like, if you don't shut up, we're going to kill you. He's like, been there, done that, got the T-shirt. <laughs> you know, it's like... Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him. Why? What's it say? Wow. We're having 
testimony and text time, right? There will be people in this room who have major breakthroughs, maybe even some who trust Christ as Savior tonight, not because of my message, but because of your two-minute testimony. There's power in it. You should be my witness. There's such a witness. I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. That's all being a witness is. That's all she knows at this point. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. Quite a contrast to the religious people of the day who said, we've got to get this guy out of here. He's disruptive. Samaritans are like, please stay with us. Please teach us more. Because of the woman's testimony, many Samaritans believed. It's one of John's favorite words. He uses the word, sometimes it's translated believe or trust. Sometimes it's noun, believers. Sometimes it's a verb. Sometimes an adjective. He uses the, the Greek word for believe or trust. It's a word, pastuo is the verb. He uses it 99 times in his gospel. That's why he wrote the book so that we would believe, and here it is, right here. Because of, his, because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Earlier this year, I got to speak at this homeschool conference in Illinois. Ellen and I didn't homeschool our kids, but I keep getting invited to all these home education conferences. It's really strange. And usually the other speaker has like 14 kids, and they're like, Phil and Ellen only have two children, but they wanted more. You know, and it's like, it's just like, I had awkward being at some of these conferences, but I, but, but I love sharing there. The keynote address I gave in Illinois was the words that every parent should dream of hearing. This isn't even a parenting passage. If you're a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa, make this the prayer that someday you will hear your kids and grandkids say, hey, Grandma, now, now I believe. Not because of what you told me, but I've seen it with my own eyes in Scripture. Jesus met me. God doesn't have any grandkids, right? You can't ride your parents, grandparents' spiritual coattails into heaven. It's got to be fresh. It's got to be first-hand faith. Pray that you will hear your kids say, now I believe. Not because you told me it's true, but I know it for myself. Praise God. Because of the woman's testimony, Many Samaritans believed. They heard it from him directly. Many more declare that it is ultimately Jesus' own words that convince them he truly is the Savior of the world. I just pretty much took you through this story. If you were listening, I mean, there was so much to learn from here, but I hope tonight that you captured the way Jesus related to her. The order that he talked to her, the incredible respect, the tenderness in the conversation. I summarized it this way to make it fit the pattern. I said, Jesus treats God's daughters with dignity and compassion. The next time you hear somebody make a statement about, you know, Christianity, Christianity just doesn't work in our culture today. Christianity wants to hold women back. Christianity wants to keep women down. I want you to think about this story. They have misinterpreted. They've yanked a few statements of Jesus totally out of context. You look at the flow of his actual interactions with women, there, there's dignity, there's compassion, there's a high level of respect, there's tremendous sensitivity, there's tenderness there. So, 
So, ladies, even sometimes by Christ followers, even sometimes by those of us who get to stand up in front with the microphone, sometimes we have not presented this to you accurately. Please forgive us. Your earthly father, man, every time you go to pray and somebody says, Dear Father, you cringe. Because if our Heavenly Father is anything like our earthly father, man, he loves, but it's only if you meet certain conditions. He's there sometimes, not there sometimes. Heavenly Father is different than that. And when Jesus came to earth, he says, I've come to reveal to you the Father. So it's not just teaching about it, now he shows us. And one of the first examples is with a woman of Samaria who's just going about her day trying to get some water. She's had a lot of heartache in her life. She's the kind of person who might say, um, if you really were the Messiah, you wouldn't be even talking to me. And I believe Jesus would go, no, it's precisely because I am the Messiah, the promised deliverer, why somebody like you is exactly why I came. What an encouragement. Guys, we got to up our game. We got to up our game. Treat women with dignity, with compassion. Up your language. Don't, e don't even say stupid stuff, even jokingly. Well, you know, women, they're good for making babies and making breakfast. No, and if that's the only thing you remember from this sermon, that's a problem. Let's love the women in our lives like Jesus loved this Samaritan woman. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you. Thank you for this powerful story. It is, it is simple, but it's profound. Lord, in the details. We say the devil is in the details. In this case, the divine is in the details. Why did you pick her? Why did you even set aside the customs of the day? because you loved her. And it's so cool that in John 3 you talk to Nicodemus, a religious leader. And the message there is no matter how holy you are, you can never be good enough to erase your need for a Savior. And to this woman, he says, no matter how broken you are, you'll never erase my love for you. It's so, cool. it's so cool, Lord, that those chapters are back to back. Lord, every one of us in this room can relate to one or the other of those characters, and honestly, I see myself in both those stories. I pray that each of us will walk away tonight overwhelmed again that had we been the only person on earth, Jesus still would have come. Because it's not just that Jesus loved the whole world. Jesus loved you and Jesus loved me. Help us to communicate those same values, to treasure women and men like Jesus did. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to transition into text and testimony, uh, but you've been sitting for a while, so Nia and Alicia are going to lead us in our theme song, and after that, Chaplain Paul Ciotta is going to come and lead us in our TNT. So let's stand together and sing our theme song. You're my anchor, you're my hope, so when the storms begin to blow, I know that you are in control throughout the ages. You are faithful, Lord. You're my anchor, you're my hope. So when the storms begin to blow, I know that you are in control throughout the ages. You are faithful, Lord. Your word is a lighthouse guiding me when I cannot see. 
must be faithful as we follow closely where you lead. You've given us salvation for all who will believe. We will hold on to the promise we received. Here we go. You're my anchor, you're my hope. So when the storms begin to blow, I know that you are in control throughout the ages. You are faithful, Lord. You're my anchor, you're my hope. So when the storms begin to blow, I know that you are in control throughout the ages. You are faithful, Lord. You are faithful, Lord. You are faithful, Lord. Good job. Let's try that again. You may be seated. Colony guys all responded appropriately. <laughs> Welcome to Text and Testimony. This is a Wednesday night tradition at the Colony of Mercy Chapel. Every Wednesday night, we have a service, and that service involves the men of the colony and the neighborhood who come and share what God is doing in their lives through the word. This week at the colony, we are studying sanctification. Every week at the colony, we go through a separate topic. And this week, it's sanctification. One of the verses that we're meditating on is in Ephesians 2. Now, the book of Ephesians was written by Paul as a means of helping them to understand their identity in Christ. And in chapter 2, starting in verse Eight, he writes, for you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that anyone can boast. So it's not about us. We can't do anything about it. It's all about God. He does the work. He does the effort. He reaches out. He's the one who saves us, not by anything we can do. But here's the sanctification part. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. See, he knew who we were going to be. He knew that before we were conceived. But then when we accept his son, that's, sancti that's justification. Sanctification is when we begin to grow, and we grow into opportunity for us to serve him. There's where the sanctification part comes in. We got nothing to do with that either, by the way. So the cool part is we could just let God be God and allow him to do the work. Amen? Amen? This is the opportunity for both men in the colony, women at Barbara's Place, and any graduate of the colony or Barbara's Place to share what God is doing in their lives through his word. So who's going to be first? Joshua. Hey, I'm Joshua. Um, yeah, it's interesting because uh, the I've been like thinking a lot about how like you know repentance is a gift from God. Like it's it's nothing I did. It's something that He granted me, and like the good works that I do are stuff that He has pre-planned for me. Like I didn't really have much of a hand in it. Um, so I think it's interesting how you would mention that. And I have a little like something I wrote uh, about that. Uh, I work in Raws. I'm in the pantry, so I like do a lot of like chopping vegetables and a lot of my wraps or whatever you want to call them start off about you know chopping vegetables and this one came uh, came to me while I was like slicing tomatoes so that that's where it starts but it kind of takes off from there um, so yeah chopping tomatoes into slices the gift of salvation is priceless as I was dead in my sin lifeless he saved me from all of my vices met me in my time of crisis said you need a solution to these problems christ is he's your prize so go on pursue him i've got good works planned for you go do them the lord is sending me out on a mission and he is blessing me i don't want to miss him 
I've spent enough time in the kingdom of darkness. Now I'm storing treasures in heaven where my heart is. And I want to bring the whole world with me. No more death. We all should be living, worshiping, praising eternally. Because the Lord's calling us all. He said, return to me. Because flesh and blood is not the enemy. We fight against powers and principalities. So Lord, empty me of myself. Remove the doubt from me. Allow me to hear your voice speaking loud to me. Because the enemy is mad. He is shouting. Let your love pour over me like a fountain. Use me to speak peace to confusion. I'm blessed to witness what you're doing in my life and in those around me. So Lord, be with me and my newfound family. I've heard it said, blood is thicker than water, and the blood of the lamb slaves us from the slaughter. Josh, Josh is my counselee. <laughs> We're going to be cutting an album real soon. That's right. <laughs> so anybody want to try to top that tonight? No, they're all quiet. Let's just close in prayer. No, I'm kidding. Who's next? Who dares? Who's next? Brother Joshua, you already know that was some hot fire for God. Amen, brother. Uh, I just want to thank God for all you brothers and all you people that are coming out here and experiencing the joy that I've got to know from five months of spending time at Keswick and coming through the colony. I've really learned and been able to see that rejoicing in trials is what we're called to do and what God's been trying to show me in my time here and it's a really important verse for me that you've been praying on Phil James 122 but be doers of the word not hearers only deceiving yourselves because that's what this place preaches that's what this place teaches and it's a beautiful beautiful thing to see because I came in here and I was like if they don't have the word of God as their top priority then I don't want I don't want to be here but as you can see from these packed six rows and all the brothers here with smiles on their faces, it's a wonderful place to be. And I'm really excited to continue on a discipleship and grow in whatever it is God wants me to grow in. And I know that's spreading that steadfast love to all your brothers. Thank you for being a part of my life. For those who aren't aware, after a man finishes the 120-day program, he is invited to consider the possibility of discipleship, which is another three months in which we begin the process of helping a man put better application to what he's learned over his time in the colony and apply it to what he's going to do and lead his family, lead his church, lead his workplace, where God calls him to be sanctified. So that's what Ryan is doing right now. He's in discipleship. So who's next? I told you before you don't have to give me the mic if you don't want to. <laughs> Two minutes. Two? All right, all right. Well, let me tell you this. It's been quite a week. It's been, um, I want to say that I'm glad my wife is here for the week of conference. She's visiting and uh, been a big encouragement to me. And I love her and she will always be treated with dignity and compassion. I'm sorry for the past, but let's change that. But I wanna say that um, in sanctification week, today was trauma counseling for me and told people at the lunch table, I'm not responsible for all my emotions after that. <laughs> And guess what? I am responsible for him, and I have to apologize to some people. But um, um, I don't always respect people like I should, but that's part of my sanctification. And I'm, I'm learning. 
And my wife is teaching me. Because she taught me this week. Was it this week? I think. How to surrender. I know how. I know what the word is. But she said, you can do it in two letters. Just, okay. <laughs> and uh, so when there's things I don't want to do, when there's things that I am upset about and don't know what the next thing is, I can say, okay. I just have to say, okay. And um, the text I wanted to say is, no matter what happens, if everything falls through, God is still with me. In him, we live and move and have our being. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord I just want to give all the honor and glory to God today for where I stand. You know, it all happened to me. First, I want to comment and congratulate you on putting that woman first because when I look at a woman, a female, I see my grandmother, I see my mother, I see my wife, I see my daughter, I see my sister, and that's the perception I want to have of every female I see because one thing I've come to learn in life is it's virtually impossible to choose your relatives, but you can choose anybody to be your family. But a relative is something that's genetically given to you by God. But you only loan them to you, he eventually gonna call you home. But moving forward, I wanna thank my brothers in Christ because I was caught up in a whirlwind for 60 years and didn't realize the damage that was done to me when I was younger until I came into treatment for the very first time two months ago. And there's a gentleman here, okay, who knows a gentleman that introduced me to treatment and he sends the hand to me. His name is Sean McLaughlin. And I went to a place called Beekman Point. And I seen Sean. And I see how God had you. I got out with Sean. I see how God had used Sean to be that light for me, to guide my path. And I cried for 20 minutes, Sean came to Keswick and he offered his hand to me for treatment and I took it because I had to throw that pride away. And in accepting that invitation, come to find out Sean brings the Christian ministries up to Beacon Point. Sean came one week and then Pastor Joe came the next week. And not knowing that they had this in store for me, I was asked about Keswick, went online to the application. But when I seen all the enemies and how close they could draw me to the father that I didn't have in my life, because I had a father who was a pastor for 46 years. And before he passed away, I forgave my father for introducing me to trust issues, introducing me to abandonment. But I forgave my father, so I didn't carry any resentment or hatred around towards him. But in come the Keswick, I got to know who my father is and I'm being drawn closer to my father. And I'm truly grateful for that. I am truly grateful for the brothers. I said earlier that everybody I, I see in life now is a, is a mirror. I use what God uses as a reflection as to who I am, who I could have been. And for once, I've never been in the place where I can be found guilty, okay, and be strengthened of it. Because of my faults, because of my bad decision, where I'm weak, God is strong, okay? There's nothing I can do, I come to find out, okay, that can get me to glory. I just wanna be drawn closer to them. For that, I am truly grateful for the chapels, for the humor, for the misunderstandings, for the arguments, okay? Because all that is growth. 
and I'm truly grateful for this ministry. Thank you, Kedrick. Thank you, God. Wednesdays is my favorite day of the week. It really is. Who's next? Hi, I'm Isaac. Um, um, I'm going to draft off of uh, Dr. Phil and just uh, throw some honor and praise to my grandma. If I'm not talking about uh, God or my son, I'm talking about my grandma. Um, ask Ward, actually. I was just bragging about her to him about she's the one who got me here. Um, my uncle had gone through here, her, her youngest brother, and she had pressed me throughout the years of my uh, struggles with alcohol um, to come here. And I'm like, nah, can't do the four months. Uh, and when I finally decided, she made like one phone call with her prayer group and they got the money together for me. And their prayers are also what kept me alive through the raging alcoholic that I was. And um, to recount very loosely, because I'm a blackout drunk, was a blackout drunk, no longer. Um, one of the stories that she had reminded me of, you know, was uh, she had brought me up to go to church, kind of used that as like a, I tricked my grandma into taking me to church, but then I slipped away and went to the liquor store. Got blackout drunk at the mall. Um, from what she's telling me, I got into a crazy argument at Applebee's. <laughs> and um, yeah, always Applebee's, right? Um, <laughs> and so, friendly neighborhood. Uh, and she stood in the gap as the cops were trying to arrest me. She would not let them take me. And that's just symbolic of her being spiritually in the gap for me all these years. And um, I think about that all the time because, like, you know, there's like a 50-year gap between us, but that's like one of my best friends. Um, we love the same. Uh, the way that we view God is the same. Um, and we just vibe on so many levels that, you know, that 50 years seems like nothing. The love of God brings us so close that it's, those years don't even matter. Um, and so I will always refer to her as my angel. And she actually called me that in the letter that she wrote me. And um, she's got four other grandchildren, but I'm the favorite. So <laughs> I, I, it's just what it is, you know. I didn't call for two weeks and she's calling looking for me like something happened, like you know where I'm at, like I'm, I'm here. But I'm, I'm trying to make it a habit, you know, uh, make sure I always keep my grandma in the loop because she's always praying for me. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I just love the fact that uh, this message is really bringing to remembrance all the stuff that, not just my grandma, but my mom as well. I just, you know, again, me and my grandma vibe differently, so I'm always going to big up her a little more. But um, it's just a beautiful thing to see. Um, when they were worried about me, I used to get annoyed. I'm like, yo, I'm good, I'm good, like, stop bothering me. Now I'm like, wow, thank you, God, that someone is worried about me enough to call and check up on me and make sure I'm okay. Because um, it's a scary thing when God just leaves you to your vices, you know? That's when you should really be worried. And when family does that too, when they start to disconnect, you know, you should be worried because um, you need that power of prayer to carry you through certain things that you're not able to do on your own. And so, um, you know, she's not here, but thank you, Grandma, for everything. I will continue to honor her sacrifice by remaining faithful where I'm at here at America's Keswick. Amen. They say you don't mess with a praying mother. You don't mess with a praying grandmother. <clears throat> no. There's some, there's some like a direct line that, you know, God says, okay, mom, you just wait. I got to listen to her first. That's what no one says. Who's next? I got another one back there if you want to ponder for a minute. Okay. 
What's that? Okay. All right, thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> I just, uh, the, the um, category that we're, Dr. Tuttle brought here is beautiful. And um, I can't believe how strong women are, not just daughters, but mothers and uh, wives. We're in the colony of mercy, which is for addiction and alcoholism. And uh, what a burden that is for a woman to marry into. And you know, we're cleaned up and we're working and showering and getting educated, but uh, the disaster that we present prior to getting here is unspeakable. And uh, I married a girl seven years younger than me uh, 29 years ago, only a couple, of, on July 9th, 1994. And I made a promise to that woman. I wrote my own vows and I didn't keep them. And we had a contract and a covenant, and I didn't honor it. And, uh, and that girl kept her act together while I fell apart and raised my kids. I raised them too for a very long time, but uh, what, a, what a gift. And, and how many women get stuck in inner cities and anywhere with all the mess we leave when we get drugs and alcohol. And yeah, we can look like great guys and we can clean up our act. But thank God you brought that message here. I have two daughters and two sons. And I don't wish my daughters have to go through what I put my ex-wife through. And uh, I'll never, uh, I'll forgive myself, but um, this is no joke. Like this is, this isn't a joke. These women, they, they're the strongest thing I've ever seen. You know something? I'm in construction, and I can used to be able to lift rafters and carry roofing shingles. But a, women can hold a baby here for like three hours. I, don't, I can't figure it out. I can't even 10 minutes. I'm like, this is heavy. And I put it, my child down. <laughs> so uh, I thank you for bringing recognition to women. And I'll say something, uh, women get disrespected way too much. I was in rehab after rehab and I couldn't stand some of the things. And I'm, I think it's time we respect women and give them the recognition for their strength, perseverance, and the bond between a mother and a child is the strongest thing I've ever seen in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew. Hey everybody, my name is Matt. Um, this will be my last uh, TNT service. I'm graduating Sunday. So, um, uh, I also, <laughs> no. I also am uh, a counselee of Chap Paul and I have learned absolutely nothing in 115 date, no, I'm just joking, that's okay. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so um, just want to read a verse uh, real quick, just encouragement to the brothers here. This is, um, you know, we live in a bubble, uh, and things are uh, sometimes easy as far as spiritually. We, we, we do a lot of uh, legwork. We, we are in meetings, small groups. Uh, we, we do a lot. We stay busy. Um, and even at Keswick, even in the colony, it's easy to get pulled one way or the other. There are uh, a lot of distractions, a lot of, a lot of stuff going on amongst the brothers in the colonies. It's kind of tough getting dropped into a uh, living facility with 30-something grown men. It's not the easiest thing. So um, I just want to encourage you guys real quick. Um, this verse... 
April 17th, Chat Paul asked me to read this verse and memorize it, and although I never successfully memorized it for him, um, I wrote it on a piece of paper and I hung it on my desk. And this verse has served as just a way to center myself. Um, it's, been, it's been a filter. It's been a distraction filter. And so I just want to read it for you guys. This is um, it's Philippians 3, uh, excuse me, Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. And, um, you know, I, I wish I could uh, just stand here and tell you guys all night long about all the things God has done in my life, um, especially... Uh, given tonight's message with uh, Dr. Tuttle with the women. Um, I have several women in my life who a um, uh, relationship was all but lost with, my wife uh, included in that. Um, we were on divorce's doorstep when she dropped me off here, and God has um, restored my marriage. And um, yeah. So... So my, um, my prayer, my encouragement for the brothers that I'm leaving behind, new guys, old guys, um, focus on the trustworthy things, focus on the good things, focus on the Lord. At the end of the day, it's the only thing that is true. And it's the only thing that's gonna keep us grounded. It's the only thing that's gonna help us sharpen each other's iron and um, I am just so grateful for all of you. Words cannot express what you guys mean to me, what the Colony of Mercy has meant to me. Chat, Paul, I love you with all my heart. And so, thank you guys. The guy you just saw standing here is not the one that his wife dropped off at the colony. She had the good sense of slowing down to 20 miles an hour before she pushed him out of the car. <laughs> but that man has allowed God to use him, and um, that's what makes what we do so special. So thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, I see a very sheepish hand in the back. I'm coming. Well, this is my second trip. The first time I was here four years ago, I stayed seven months. Um, we come broken, I left broken. But I came back this time because God told me that Keswick is where he met me for the first time, and this is where he wanted to continue to fix me. So I am the daughter of a king, and I plan on allowing him to use my story for his glory. And I just want to say everybody, my sisters, we're going to continue. This journey isn't over. It's just begun. Congratulations, God. Who's going to be next? Michael, number seven here. Um, you guys remember Dean? Uh, I'm was affected when he put on his heart to pray for everyone who had left. Um, and some of you don't remember Nick Versad, some of you do. Uh, I just spoke with him on the phone today. He said uh, he wasn't doing too well. Um, so just as Jesus prayed in John 17, 15, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but thou should keep them from the evil. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy truth is, uh, thy word is truth. 
um, that they may all be one as thou father art in me and I in thee that they may also be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me so just as Jesus prayed for them I would like to pray for them Lord you know the needs of everyone who has gone from the colony Lord um, be with yeah, Lord, be with everyone who will come and who will go. Yeah, we don't know. We don't have a record of everyone, Lord, um, but you do. You keep track. You're with everyone. Lord, be with them and comfort them in their needs. And you see them and you know them, Lord. Uh, direct their steps and continue to sanctify them, Lord. And thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Good, it's a good time to put in a plug. If you, um, we appreciate your prayers. Um, we pray not just for the guys who are in the colony, the ladies at Barbara's place. Uh, please pray for the chaplains, the staff, uh, but also pray for the guys and the ladies that are struggling with coming to the colony, and the ones that we have on the wait list, and the ones that you know we've had to to make room to bring in for the men who are in the colony and the ladies at BP who are struggling whether they should stay or go or, or just please pray for us. And so it's, um, and that we can make, they can make, we all can make wise choices, godly focused choices. We, we'd appreciate that. Okay, who's next? Okay, got to run back again. Here we go. Hello. Hi, my name is Haley. Um, I graduated at Barber's Place in October. Um, at first, you know, coming here was not easy. Um, I was very prideful. Um, always had to stand up for myself. I had my daughters really young. I have twins. Um, so I always felt like the odds were against me. Everyone's looking at you. Everyone's like, you know, doubting you. How is she going to do it? And it was true. It was hard. You know, it's still hard. <laughs> but before coming into Barbara's Place, I, you know, I started my struggle with alcohol. Um, I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm already struggling with raising the girls, and now I'm, now I'm an alcoholic. Um, being a mother and coming to Barbara's place um, is probably the most difficult thing ever, okay? You are already away from your children. Um, you have the, your reputa reputation on the line. Um, you don't feel you, you're good enough for God, you know? How you're a mom and you're an alcoholic. Um, but coming here, finally got through, you know, to come to Keswick, and it was the best de decision in my life. Um, a lot of sleepless nights in the beginning, but I always said, make it through the first month. Just at least a month, the first month. Then it became the second, then it became the third. I'm like, all right, two weeks, I'm out. Now I'm here. <laughs> at the summer weeks. Um, honestly, I would trust in myself. I used to be the kind of woman that would say, you know, I am enough. But honestly, trust in the Lord. And I'm gonna say this verse. It's Isaiah 26, four. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the internal rock. And ladies, now, Barbara's place, you guys have such a special place in my heart. Like, seriously, I've been there. And when you get out of here, it's gonna, get, it's gonna be a little rough. But trust in the Lord, he is your internal rock, okay? Okay, hi. Um, my name is Alyssa. Um, I'm at Barbara's Place. I've been here for a little over five months. Um, 
Lately, the struggle has kind of just been with making decisions. Um, I didn't plan to be alive this long, so being here has kind of brought up open doors and the future and just thinking how many things have to get done. Um, I didn't, the way I was going, I shouldn't have lived past 21, so now I'm here and all the time Lord willing, that I have left is overwhelming. Um, so with my decision to stay, it's kind of just been, what does the future hold? I have to start making these plans. It's up to me to make sure I do what the Lord needs me to do. And clearly that is a distorted view. It's not up to me. I can't make the decisions. I have tried that before, trying to plan out my life and figure out what he wants me to do before he lets me know. That's not how it works. Um, and just with my age, it's kind of been a struggle with keeping decisions and telling myself that I am called to be here even though I know that I am. Um, and just the scripture that always comes to mind is 1 Timothy 4.12. Um, <laughs> Let me make sure I'm going to say it right. It is, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Um, and just, I hold on to that the entire time that I'm here. Um, no matter what age you are, young or older, it doesn't matter the call that the Lord puts on your heart is the call he puts on your heart. And he just happened to tell me I'm meant to serve. So that's what I plan on doing. And I just praise him for bringing me here and allowing me that chance. We'll make this last call. One more. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Kevin. Um, hey Kevin. I'm, I'm from Philadelphia, Kensington section, and uh, I, I was tore up smoking crack, man, for like a long, 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 long time. Um, my pastor's here, one of my pastors, Pastor Joe. I'm just in a good mood because they're, they're here. Um, it's been a struggle here, I'm not comfortable, and that's a good thing that I'm not comfortable you know I'm, I'm reading scripture I'm being purged of you know pride and arrogancy and drug abuse and, and what have you a plethora of things that aren't God like and um, I've, I've been reading scripture and my one of my favorites I shared like last week about this um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not on our own understanding, and then always acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And um, that scripture led me to the guy who tried to, the dude who tried to catch the Ark of the Covenant, leaning on his you know, own understanding, and, and God smote him. He dropped dead, like, you know, he was leaning on his own understanding, thinking that he was helping God out by not letting it hit the ground. And that's me. So I got to, like, stop leaning on my own understanding and uh, get this thing right. I'm proud of my church, The Rock. They, they've been very, very supportive of me. Um, There's not much more I can say. I'm looking forward to... Just doing the right thing, man. And just put them on the floor. Kensington's a rough stop, but my heart is there. You know, helping all the addicts and whatnot. I, I'm a chef, you know, culinary dude. And I bring home food, and they look forward to it. And, then, and they're in bondage to crack, I mean, to drugs, man. And, and my addiction was crack, and mine was mental. And, and they're shooting up that Fetty Wap or fentanyl and trank, you know, and theirs is physical. And, and I really feel for them. My heart is, you know, my heart is for trying to 
work with my church in that area. We're right there at Kensington and Somerset, man. It's like ground zero, zombie land. And um, that, that's where I, I think, I, I know my calling is there. I know it is. I have to be prepared, put on that full armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 and get it right this time. That's all I have. Back in January, I got a call from a lifelong friend who asked me to pray about getting one of his family members into the Colony of Mercy. And so we began to pray, and I, I sort of forgot about it. And then we were preparing for our Easter choir musical, and at rehearsal, this young man came up to me and introduced himself, and he said, uh, you don't know me, but you know my uncle. And I said, well, who's your uncle? And he told me who his uncle was. And inside, um, I got really, really emotional. I'm going to put a picture up here just to tell you the backstory of this. So the guy on this end is Matt's uncle. Uh, that is Paul Palmer, Jr., who is the chairman of the board at Sandy Cove Ministries, where I spent a good portion of my early life serving as a kid and then later on as vice president for seven years. Uh, Paul's dad, Uncle Paul, uh, served at Sandy Cove for decades, uh, working at Hilltop Ranch and also serving with the ministry of Sandy Cove. And his father, George Palmer, was the founder of Sandy Cove Ministries. And as I think about it, there's this ripple effect that takes place when God transforms a life. George Palmer and Addison Rawls, the, found, the son of the founder of this ministry, were really, really, really good friends. And over the years, these two ministries have interlocked in, in amazing ways. And I got thinking about when I heard Matt stand up and give his testimony tonight. What is God going to do now in his life as that generation continues because of what the Lord's done in his life here at the Colony of Mercy. There is a ripple effect that takes place that's absolutely incredible. So when you give a gift to the Colony of Mercy or Barber's Place, you're not just investing in the men that are here now. That gift that you give allows them to find new life in Christ, and that can have a ripple effect for generations in their families because as we heard last night what God did in Raphael's life took place in his wife's life and then in his daughter's life and what's going to happen now in that next generation together we get to be a part of God's big story and so tonight I want to encourage you to consider a gift for the Ministry of Addiction Recovery here at America's Keswick I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. There are lots of ways you can give. You can use the QR code. Uh, you can give a gift online. You can drop a gift off at the desk if you are not prepared to do so tonight, or you can give in the offering. But know that we appreciate and we need your prayers and your financial support in a very powerful way to do what God has called us to do. So let's have a word of prayer as we ask God's blessing on the offering. Pastor, can you lead us tonight in prayer for the offering? We're going to stand together as we do the offering and sing about where our hope is found. That's in Jesus Christ alone. Let's sing this out. In Christ alone, 
my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Just take your seats for just a moment. The crew is going to come up and make some announcements, talk about what's happening tonight and tomorrow morning. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. So what's happening tonight? Ahoy, ahoy, mateys. Did you guys have a good day? I thought it was a marvelous day. How many of you did the slip and slide? Slip and slide. What? I thought there was more than that. Oh, it's all the kids. What happened in the Maver family? You didn't do the slip and slide? Some of them did. Some of them were out there. Okay, so you'll get a chance to do it tonight because we're going to do glow in the dark. Oh, no. No. Okay. <laughs> don't say that. Please don't say that. <laughs> Much more low key evening. <laughs> yeah. So, what's going on, I guess, along with, every, with, the, with kind of the big event at 9 o'clock? Okay, well, first of all, I like your shirt. Nice. Oh, thank you. Drop a leg, it's yacht. Right after this, you go pick up your kids from Children's Ministry. 
And then we have uh, the pool, hot tub, sauna are going to be open. The snack shack is open. Do we have a special tonight, mm. Zach and Dan? I got the inside scoop on this one. Yeah. Ooh. Three whole buffalo chicken tenders. <laughs> wow. With on, dip. on top of the barbecue meal. With dip. Oh, my That's goodness. Right. That's right. People are going to be resting tomorrow. Can't eat too much chicken. That's right. And then we have a movie tonight over in the Millsaps yep. room. We have Chronicles of Narnia, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Chronicles of Narnia. Oh, right, yeah. That's what I meant. I think we've Troy missed that one at dinner. That's right. That was good. So we do have a really special event uh, taking place at the bonfire at 9 o'clock. We're going to have a bonfire worship time. So please come on out and continue to worship our Lord at 9 o'clock. We're going to have schmores as well. Schmores. Schmores. Plenty of schmores. And then what? <laughs> that's good. Then that's it for tonight. Then Leave you guys go to bed. And, and then we have some morning activities. Yeah. In the morning, we have devotions with Brian Ferguson. He's uh, the head of our housekeeping department. Then at 8 o'clock, we have breakfast. We have our prayer options at 8.45, men's and women's prayer in the Millsaps and Peterson room. The war room is open. And we have SPF 30 with James Serpico. Yep. He's a good guy. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow night, we're going to start 15 minutes early. Uh, the children's ministry program is going to do a presentation of what they learned. So if you will join us at 645. And then, then tomorrow night's our last session of the week. I can't believe wow. it. We're ready. Crazy. And wow. uh, we have a fun way to end our program tomorrow night uh, in honor of our 100th anniversary. So you don't want to miss tomorrow night. Really quick, Bill. We do have another morning photo opportunity, a sunrise photo op tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty big hit yesterday morning, so Jason, uh, Jason's going to do that again tomorrow morning, 518, 518. on Whoa. the dot. Mm -hmm. All right, let's stand room. together. We normally close with a benediction from Deuteronomy 31.8 when we're together at the Colony of Mercy, and that will be our benediction tonight. Again, thanks to all the men and the students of Barbara's Place who shared their testimonies tonight. That was an unbelievable blessing for all of us. Let's say it together. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee. Fear not. Fear not. Neither be dismayed. Deuteronomy 31.8. Hey, have a good night. Don't forget to come back and see Nye and Alicia, the Lewises, and Joyce.